All right, um, please stop me and interrupt me, Elizabeth, especially. Um, I am not used to doing presentations on Zoom. So if you cannot hear me or uh, if you need me closer, anything, please uh, let me know. Also, I'm a little bit concerned about the connectivity. So um, hopefully you can let me know if that's an issue too. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so I was asked to present on stress and stress management. I am a licensed mental health counselor here in Iowa. Um, I've been in this field for about eight years and have had my own practice for the last two. Um, I also do some trauma-informed yoga therapy. So uh, really bringing in trauma and stress and anxiety. So I'm very excited that I was asked to do this presentation tonight. This is definitely um, something that I'm interested in and talk with all of my clients about. Um, on a regular basis. So to get started, you will see a poll come up on your screen. I want you to take the next minute or two to just kind of reflect on your biggest current stressors. So there's 10 options here. They're kind of general and vague. Hopefully your current stressors would fall under one of these categories or multiple, but you can select more than one. So as you are ready, just go ahead and select those top stressors. I'll give you another 30 seconds or so. All right, it looks like about 75% have um, completed this. So we'll go ahead and just kind of review it a little bit. Um, Elizabeth, can everybody see this on their screen? Can they see the results? Uh, yeah, yep, yep. It comes up like uh, how much the percentage. Do you want me to read a view? No, no, I can see it too. I just wanted to make sure. Um, I'm not sure if everyone would someone want to put in the chat or something. Oh, they can't see it. <laughs> okay, so we'll have to read it off to them. <laughs> All right. Um, so just going from the top, um, the highest one that was ranked, it was the current state of our country. So COVID, um, political uncertainty, social injustice. Um, next in line is anxiety. That is 64%. And the current state of our country was 73%. Um, let's see, financial concerns looks to be the next in line. That's 45% of you. Um, academic stress is 36%. And then there were quite a few 27%. So physical health concerns, interpersonal issues, um, disordered eating and body image issues and depression. 
Okay. So the two that ranked the lowest on this current stressors is adjusting to college and identity struggles. So that gives me a lot of good information to, to kind of work with and um, to kind of think about as I move forward with the rest of our presentation. Um, but that also doesn't really surprise me that the current state of our country was the top stressor right now. All right, so, oh, I could have shared the results. Sorry, everybody. No, I just did. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I didn't know. We're learning. <laughs> All right, it works. Okay, I'm just going to X out of this one. All right, so next I have just about a five minute video that um, describes stress and it's kind of like cartoonish, but it's a TED talk. So I think it's, it's really informative. Um, it's a lot of information, so bear with me. I think it's, I think it's worth it. Cramming for a test? Trying to get more done than you have time to do? Stress is a feeling we all experience when we are challenged or overwhelmed. But more than just an emotion, stress is a hardwired physical response that travels throughout your entire body. In the short term, stress can be advantageous, but when activated too often or too long, your primitive fight or stress response not only changes your brain, but also damages many of the other organs and cells throughout your body. Your adrenal gland releases the stress hormones cortisol, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and norepinephrine. As these hormones travel through your bloodstream, they easily reach your blood vessels and heart. Adrenaline causes your heart to beat faster and raises blood pressure. Over time, causing hypertension, cortisol can also cause the endothelium or inner lining of blood vessels to not function normally. Scientists now know that this is an early step in triggering the process of atherosclerosis or cholesterol plaque buildup in your arteries. Together, these changes increase your chances of a heart attack or stroke. When your brain senses stress, it activates your autonomic nervous system. Through this network of nerve connections, your big brain communicates stress to your enteric or intestinal nervous system. Besides causing butterflies in your stomach, this brain-gut connection can disturb the natural rhythmic contractions that move food through your gut, leading to irritable bowel syndrome, and can increase your gut sensitivity to acid, making you more likely to feel heartburn. Via the gut's nervous system, stress can also change the composition and function of your gut bacteria, which may affect your digestive and overall health. Speaking of digestion, does chronic stress affect your waistline? Well, yes. Cortisol can increase your appetite. It tells your body to replenish your energy stores with energy-dense foods and carbs, causing you to crave comfort foods. High levels of cortisol can also cause you to put on those extra calories as a visceral or deep belly fat. This type of fat doesn't just make it harder to button your pants. It is an organ that actively releases hormones and immune system chemicals called cytokines that can increase your risk of developing chronic diseases such as heart disease and insulin resistance. Meanwhile, stress hormones affect immune cells in a variety of ways. Initially, they help prepare to fight invaders and heal after injury. But chronic stress can dampen the function of some immune cells, make you more susceptible to infections, and slow the rate you heal. Want to live a long life? You may have to curb your chronic stress. That's because it has even been associated with shortened telomeres, the shoelace tip ends of chromosomes that measure a cell's age. Telomeres cap chromosomes to allow DNA to get copied every time a cell divides without damaging the cell genetic code. 
in a short with each cell division. When telomeres become too short, a cell can no longer divide and it dies. As if all that weren't enough, chronic stress has even more ways it can sabotage your health, including acne, hair loss, sexual dysfunction, headaches, muscle tension, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, and irritability. So, what does all this mean for you? Your life will always be filled with stressful situations, but what matters to your brain and entire body is how you respond to that stress. If you can view those situations as challenges you can control and master, rather than as threats that are insurmountable, you will perform better in the short run and stay healthy in the long run. So it was a lot of information. It can be kind of overwhelming to hear um, really everything that stress can do to our bodies. Um, as you saw from the video and you heard from the video, stress is, is totally common. It's not something that we can really get away from, but it can be extremely damaging and life-threatening if we don't learn how to manage it. So, um, like, like the slide says, um, it causes moods to plummet, anxiety to magnify, blood pressure to skyrocket, and it also can weaken our immune system. Stress and anxiety can provoke different responses in different people, so we're all going to be responding to it differently, um, but it does often fall into at least one of our three reptilian modes of fighting, um, fleeing, or freezing. So, when it comes to stress and anxiety, I think that it's really important to identify our stressors and to be able to kind of give these feelings space and, and really process what's going on for us. But I also think that it's um, really important to spend the rest of the time to utilize tools that, that can help manage that stress, that can um, help us stay relaxed to uh, decrease our blood pressure, strengthen that immune system. Um, there is no shame for feeling anxious. And really, I, I don't want to minimize the, um, the necessary step of naming those stressors and really setting aside some time to reflect on our stress and how we're doing. Um, I also wanted to note too, I don't think we said this in the beginning, but if you have questions throughout the presentation, if you want to, um, unmute yourself and ask the question, or you can type it into the chat box. Um, Tressa and Elizabeth will be keeping an eye on the chat. So if you do have a question as I'm going through this information, please, I'd like it to be more of an interactive um, presentation. So chime in. Um, also, I just wanna say, remember that you are not alone. Most students are feeling the exact same ways that you are. And I, I like that poll that we did so that you could actually here too, that um, most of you were in the same categories and um, really dealing with the same stressors. Next, I wanted to spend some time doing a little bit of mindfulness and meditation and also um, bringing your attention to your breath. So this is something that I work with all of my clients on and I think um, I think it's huge for managing stress and really being being more present and in the moment. So I, I'll talk about this a little bit later on too, but um, mindfulness is really being in the moment, being intentional and doing one thing at a time. So the way I see our society specifically is we are so much in the past and we are um, regretting different things that we did in the past or maybe beating ourselves up for something that we said in a in a social situation in the past or we're um, really anxious and focused on the future and what might happen that we completely miss out on right here and right now um, we are go 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 people we have a lot of things to do and um we're just always on the move and i feel like that is definitely something that encourages um this lack of being present and being mindful. So um, 
mindfulness and meditation um, is something that I, I feel like is um, becoming more common and more talked about and more practiced in our society. Um, but I do want to say too, if you have never done mindfulness or meditation to not have expectations that you're going to be able to sit down and meditate for like 20 minutes, um, really starting small, like 30 seconds or a minute or two minutes, um, and kind of building off of that is something that is more realistic because again, we are just not used to doing this. So I want to spend, um, maybe in the next five or 10 minutes to create a different sort of space. Um, just checking in on where we're at and I encourage you to get into a comfortable position with mindfulness and meditation. Oftentimes it's encouraged that you are in an upright position with your back straight, but not so straight that it's uncomfortable. Um, you are awake and aware. There are some exercises that are helpful for falling asleep, but this isn't something that I would recommend for this sort of mindfulness or meditation exercise. We want to be aware of what's going on and awake to our current experience. So if it's comfortable to you, you can go ahead and close your eyes or if you'd like to keep them open, I would encourage you to create a sort of downward gaze about 45 degree angle in front of you. So you're not super focused on anything with your eyes. But I encourage you to begin to just notice your environment, notice your surroundings. If your eyes are open, this might be noticing the different things that you can see as you're sitting here in the space. If your eyes are closed, perhaps it's noticing the amount of light that is coming in through your, your closed eyelids. And I encourage you to take note of the different noises that you hear. Perhaps it's cars driving by or people in the hallway, my voice. Just taking note of what you can hear. And also becoming aware of any smells that you might be able to smell here or even any tastes. And if there isn't any present, then that is also a sensation. You don't have to go looking for anything here. The lack of a smell or a taste is also a sensation. And then beginning to note your sense of touch. So perhaps paying attention to where your body parts are touching the chair that you're sitting on or the couch that you're on, or perhaps which body parts are touching one another. Noticing the feeling of clothes against your skin. We're just simply noticing here. There's no right or wrong way to do this. There's no right or wrong answers. We're just noticing. And it's also important to note here that thoughts are going to happen. They're going to interrupt you and distract you. And that is okay. That is a part of being human nothing to be hard on yourself, berate yourself for. But we will simply acknowledge, oh, I just had that thought. I just had that distraction. And gently guide yourself back to your awareness of your body and your breath. 
we don't have to do anything with the thoughts that happen. And then I encourage you to begin to notice your sense of breath. Perhaps you notice if your breath is rapid or slow, if it's regular or irregular, if it feels cool or warm, and also noticing where in your body you are feeling your breath. Are you feeling it in your chest? Are you feeling it in your diaphragm? Are you noticing it in your nostrils as you breathe in? Perhaps it feels a little bit cool. And as you exhale, perhaps it feels a little bit warmer underneath your nose and maybe your upper lip. We're just noticing here. And again, as distractions come up, maybe you hear something, you see something, or you have a thought, that's okay. Acknowledge that you had that thought or that other distraction and gently come back to focusing on your breath. And there may be days that you practice mindfulness or meditation and you have to bring yourself back over and over and over and over again. That is okay. We are human. And now if, it's, if it feels comfortable for you, I would encourage you to place one hand on your chest and one hand on your diaphragm. And we will just breathe normally like this for the next minute or two. I know this isn't a normal way of breathing typically. You're not having your hands on, on yourself, but just breathe typically. You don't need to change your breath in any way. And if you are in a sitting position, Maybe later on tonight or tomorrow, you can try this in a lying down position and see if this is any different for you. Sometimes it's a little bit easier if you're lying down. I want you to start paying attention to which hand is moving more as you are breathing. Do you feel your breath more from your chest or more from the diaphragm? When we are anxious or panicking or we're more anxious prone people, it is very common to breathe from our chest. So breathing that irregular, rapid, shallow kind of breath from our chest. Our goal here is to get into the deeper diaphragm breath. So if you even kind of imagine our breath has a three stage cycle. We want it to get into the chest and then right underneath like our rib cage area and then our lower lungs, the deepest part would be in our, in our abdomen, in our diaphragm. With each breath, we really want to imagine like a balloon inflating and deflating inside of our stomachs with each breath. And this takes a lot of practice to get to this point.
Something that I would encourage you to do is to check in on your breathing like this several times throughout the day. And especially when you are in a relaxed state so that you're able to um, utilize this as an exercise when you are not relaxed. Check in on your breath. Ask yourself, am I breathing from my chest? Am I breathing from my diaphragm? And can I get to that deeper diaphragm breath? Now I encourage you to, again, turn your attention to your environment, to your surroundings, checking in on the five senses. So what you're noticing with sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch. Just checking in. And then if your eyes have been closed, you can gently flutter them open to let the light back in slowly. And if your eyes have been open, just slowly creating more of an, an upward gaze and coming back into our environment, back into our shared space with the presentation. And I encourage you just to take a, a mental um, reflection, mental note of how you're feeling now after doing um, five or 10 minutes of a little bit of a mindfulness breathing exercise. Our next slide here is a stress symptom checklist. Um, there are, let me see here, there are 52 items here. So if you have um, a piece of paper and a pencil or pen next to you, you can tally these or again, just kind of keep a mental note. Um, I want you to go through this list of 52 items and tally up how many of these symptoms you have experienced in the last month and experienced to like a significant degree. So if you just have like one cold or um, you felt nauseous one time, like I wouldn't count that as something significant, but these are things that you are, are experiencing on a pretty regular basis in the last month. What does it mean by irrational fears? Um, it would be like, oh, uh, like, um, I'm going to get into, uh, terrible car accident. Um, I mean, really having like pretty fears that aren't like super rational. If you're gonna think about like, what's logically gonna happen? What's the probability of that happening? It's not very probable. I'm gonna get kidnapped. Um, yeah.
This is so much different than presenting in a classroom or in a group of people. I can usually tell when people are finished, but I'll give you another minute or so just to finish up tallying. See how many total items you have check marked here. Does whoever gets the highest number wins, right? More so. <laughs> Not to brag, <laughs> my number's pretty high. <laughs> I have a scale that I'll go over and, and tell you what, what the numbers mean. Oh, good, thank you. All right, so if you circled or checkmarked or tallied anywhere from zero to seven, the, um, this PhD, this um, psychologist uh, says that your stress level is considered low. If you are anywhere from eight to 14, you're considered to have moderate stress level. 15 to 21 would be high stress. And 22 or higher is very high. I think, um, I think that these checklists and these inventories are really, really helpful and also, I think it's important to keep in mind that this could be completely different in, in any other given month. So a month from now, this might look completely different. Um, two months later might be different um, just based on every, I mean, everything going on in our world today and where you're at um, with your life and how you're spending your time and maybe what your expectations are. So I hope that this could be helpful to maybe look back on because a lot of times we don't, we're not really aware of how stressed out we are. So again, this is where like the mindfulness and the meditations can really come in handy. Um, body scans can be really helpful to really pay attention to like where we're holding our tension. Um, if we have a lot of pain, because we don't typically take the time to just stop and assess how we're doing, how we're feeling, what's going on with all of these symptoms, we don't typically sit down and, and really reflect on them. So I hope this can be helpful now and also in the future to, to check yourself. So current coping, um, we've identified your current stressors and the symptoms that you've experienced in the last month or so. And we've also learned what stress does to our bodies. So keeping in mind that we all respond to, to stress differently and engaging in unhealthy habits like drinking alcohol or loading up on caffeine and pulling all-nighters, these things can fuel anxiety and tension. So um, I hope that some of you are willing to use the chat option here to um, identify our list, share ways that you are currently coping in healthy ways. What kinds of things do you do to manage your stress and to de-stress? So again, I'll, I'll give you a minute or two to type something in if you're comfortable doing that. So I'm just gonna share what my wife said, but she said um, long walks in the what enjoying the fall foliage oh and enjoying the fall foliage yes love that love it and elizabeth can you share i'm i'm not even going to try to pull up the chat thing so i'll probably mess something up if you could list that for me <laughs> yeah for sure um gratitude uh going on walks listening to music sorry uh, you could probably hear a dog drinking water. Sorry. <laughs> uh, affirmation exercise. Yeah. I don't know if it's 
affirmation exercise or if it's affirmations and then exercise as a yeah. right um spending time with my cat um love music people going on walks podcast reading cutting back on caffeine uh schedule things um oh uh i schedule things purposefully too long so i don't feel pressured mm, good Awesome. Wow, those are great. And I'll be talking about most of those coming up here. Uh, exercise, often just a three mile walk around my neighborhood. Uh, schedule online trivia every Thursday with friends. That, I love trivia. So that's, that's awesome. awesome. That is so great. That, like, talk about intentionality and mm -hmm. also socializing. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Just a couple of weeks ago, Tressa did one and it was, it was a Halloween one. And she did a great job. Awesome. Um, we got a walk, music and family support. Yeah. Good. Good. I mean, these sound like wonderful, wonderful coping skills and techniques to incorporate for sure. My next slide here, oh, if I can figure this out. Um, this is a chart that I think is kind of handy. It uses the acronym of stay well. So to stay well, try this. The first, well, the only S I guess in stay well is, um, for sleep. They say that six to eight hours a night of proper uninterrupted sleep is best. Remember that when you are stressed, your body needs more rest. Um, here I would say too, I think it's really important to have a kind of wind down, um, nighttime bedtime routine. So whatever, whatever works for you, staying off of screens, they recommend at least 30 minutes before you're going to sleep. But I've, I've read many studies that talk about actually two hours before sleep. Um, I would encourage like turn like dimming lights maybe using candles or essential oils if scents um, are helpful for you, maybe listening to calming music. What if, if your screen time, like reading, puts you to sleep? Like, that, like you're like reading a book on? Yeah, or reading the news or probably not reading the news, but just, yeah. I don't know, reading in general. Yeah, I mean, I, I think reading is is really calming and that's something that I do every night before bed. Um, <clears throat> but on your phone? I would imagine like reading from an actual book or something on paper is gonna be better than looking at a screen. Um, but I mean, I think what you could do is um, turn your screen, your, your light right to red light instead of the blue. Um, and something that just popped up on my phone actually like two days ago was um, something for nighttime. It's like a gray. It makes my whole screen gray. And I didn't realize that I had done it until I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have any color on my screen. Like, did I drop my phone or what's going on with my phone? Um, but you can set that manually or you can have it set to like 8 p.m. or 10 p.m. or whatever, whatever time you want that to start. So I think making sure that you're, you're doing those things is going to be helpful. And if you need to be reading off of a screen and you fall asleep, I mean, I, I, I think you're getting rest. Um, one of my thoughts would be that maybe you're, you're to the point of exhaustion if you're falling asleep while you're reading things. And I've, I've had a lot of clients that have told me too that that is actually how they get to sleep. Like they, are, they look at their phone until they fall asleep. Um, so, that might just be something to think about is, are you to the point of too tired by that point? And can you, can you fall asleep without needing that? Um, let's see, take breaks, stop and take breaks. You do not need permission to take breaks. You know yourself and what your body needs. So listen, our brains need rest. Um, I think we can all share the experience of trying to get words on a paper or um, 
like finish an exam or an assignment and it's like you're trying to squeeze toothpaste out of an empty tube. Um, so I think that, yeah, you definitely need to be intentional about taking breaks. Your brain feels so much more refreshed once you actually get up, take a break. And that might be even like a couple of hours or even days at some points. So taking walks during, during breaks, um, getting outside is going to be super helpful, even as we are entering winter here in Iowa. Um, just being really intentional about taking breaks so that you're not overworking yourself and then not getting any work done. So um, being unintentional about breaks could look like stopping and starting every few minutes due to panic cycles and made up distractions like, oh, was that my phone? I, should, I better check that. Maybe it's an emergency. Um, and then, oh, oh, I need to check it again. And then you're not getting any work done. So it would actually be more beneficial for you to just stop, take a break, maybe check your phone for five or 10 minutes and then get back to work. Um, I read a study a while back when I was working out on a college campus that talked about for every 50 minutes, give yourself 10 minutes of a break. And that also works for if you're gonna be, if you're doing an assignment, like a big project or big paper, and you estimate that it's going to take you an hour and a half to do. Split that into two chunks. Don't try to get that whole thing done in one chunk of time. Take a break and then come back and it'll be much easier for you to finish it. The A here is for allies. Being intentional about who you're spending time with. Um, spend time with family and friends who support you and love you. I would also put here, be intentional about um, who you're following on social media. So if it's, if it's positive um, accounts that are supportive and affirming and um, positive, just really being intentional about everything that you are soaking in, everything around you. The why here is for yoga. This goes in hand, I think, with, with mindfulness and deep breathing and um, passive and progressive muscle relaxation, which those are the exercises that I would recommend if you are trying to fall asleep. Um, it would be good to do a passive or progressive muscle relaxation exercise. So that is like going from muscle group to muscle group, covering your entire body with relaxation. Um, well-balanced meals, making sure that you're eating fruits, vegetables, getting your protein and good fats in, definitely drink plenty of water and maybe cut back on the caffeine and the alcohol. Um, this is really important to remember because I think as students and as busy people, um, it's so much easier to just grab like, um, processed foods or go out for fried foods or order things, go through the drive-through, um, but being really intentional about having those kind of good brain foods and making sure that you are meal, meal prepping and meal planning and you're eating maybe even when you're not feeling hungry, but making sure that you are consistently fueling your body. E for exercise, aim for 20 to 30 minutes a day, maybe doing a high intensity exercise, walk, run, jog, anything that you like. I'm a big um, proponent for finding movement that your body enjoys. I do not encourage going to the gym and um, having the intention of like burning so many calories or being there for so long um, I'm definitely more of listen to your body, listen to what it needs. Some days you might want some yoga stretches. Some days you might want to go out for a, a mile run. So it's going to be different. And um, I, I would just encourage you to check in with your body and what you need in any given time. Also, there's a note here to not make this an area where you need to be perfect. So a lot of other areas, we might make that like, oh, I got to be perfect on my schoolwork and perfect with my work. Um, don't make area where you need to be perfect. Just get your body some movement. 
L is for let go. There really are things beyond your control, except that you cannot control everything and let go. And then the last L is for laugh. Can you give us an example of like what, what let go like really looks yeah. like? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I guess the, the example that comes to mind right now is the presidential elections coming up. Um, this is something that we have so much control over. We can do our part, um, but then the rest is, is kind of not in our control. So um, maybe it's helpful to be able to process the, this out, out loud with somebody or through journaling, or um, I, I encourage my clients to do art journaling. So maybe creating some art about how that is sitting with you to realize that you have a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress about the upcoming election and that you cannot physically, like you're not personal, personally um, responsible or in control of the result. So I think really identifying it, recognizing it, reflecting on it, and then moving on to something that you can control. Laugh. Um, serotonin is an antidepressant, a painkiller, a stress reducer, and it even has been linked to curing cancer. Even in the pits of distress, we can trigger our serotonin with laughter, or if you're in an exam or in a classroom with classmates, um, just simply smiling. So I encourage you to welcome humor. A good laugh goes a long way. Make sure that you're peppering your breaks with, when you're studying with your favorite funny show or with something that else that makes you smile. Your serotonin does not care if you are faking it. So um, it'll do its job regardless. So even if, <laughs> even if you just force yourself to smile or laugh, um, it's gonna feel probably pretty silly and unnatural, but um, your body really doesn't care. It's gonna get that benefit anyway. So fake it till you make it is real. Like that's a real. Fake it till you make it. It is totally real. <laughs> yes. All right. I want to be mindful of the time and also leave um, leave some time for questions and comments. If you do have questions and you want to type them in, go ahead and, and type them into the chat. Um, I'm going to try to get through one or two more slides and then. Um, yeah, leave a few minutes at the end for questions. So this slide is all about some additional self-care and stress relieving activities. Again, listed is running, do some stairs, some type of vigorous exercise. And I would say this is more so whenever you really need stress reliever. This isn't like maybe so much of the proactive, but more of the reactive state of I'm really stressed, I'm really anxious, I'm panicking or maybe nearing um, panic. How can I get some of this energy out? Meditation and mindfulness, um, those go hand in hand with the focus on breath and yoga, prayer and massage. Massage and hug, I would say kind of go hand in hand. Physical touch with um, somebody else uh, is so big for our bodies. And I know this is a little bit more difficult and right now we have um, some barriers to being able to maybe hug and touch other people like we used to, but being mindful of even again, like this kind of goes in with the fake it till you make it. If you hug yourself, you're actually, your body doesn't even know that it's not somebody else. So <laughs> you're going to get the same benefits from hugging yourself, which I think is just amazing. You always are with yourself. So you can always get a hug. So is it true that they say that you have to wait 20 seconds or if you do like the 20 second it releases some sort of endorphins or yeah yeah I, yeah I am I think the longer you can hug the more beneficial it's going to be and actually I've, I've read some studies too on hugging like so if you're hugging another person making sure that your hearts line up so that you can actually feel your body can feel the other person's heartbeat too is amazing for your body 
So, so many benefits. Um, supporting others, this is uh, definitely a stress relieving activity and something that is, can hopefully be proactive too. Um, but as you, as you support other people, you are going to feel better as well. And then I mentioned earlier, essential oils, lavender and peppermint are big essential oils for um, relaxation and stress relief. So I use oils every day. I like to make roller balls and roll them on my wrists and my neck, um, but you can also diffuse them in a diffuser or um, just simply smelling them, like opening the bottle, smelling them or putting them on a cotton ball and carrying that around with you. Um, essential oils are amazing for stress relief. All right, Elizabeth, do we have any questions in the chat? Uh, none that I can see. Okay, good, because I want to go through a couple other things. <laughs> Um, just real quick, again, reducing stress, getting up early is going to be beneficial. Um, using stress reduction techniques, we've talked about that. Staying away from electronic devices that intensify your stress, like maybe Facebook, Twitter, blogs, text messages. Um, I would venture to guess that in the next week, that might be an even more important thing to do. Um, I like to create space for myself from social media during really intense times like this. And I, I have found it beneficial. Um, you can still remain informed and connected with other people, but you don't need to be so much involved in what everybody else is saying. Avoid trying to multitask. Um, we actually know that you cannot study effectively while you're talking on the phone or while you're cooking or while you're on Facebook or checking your emails um, or watching TV. In fact, um, studies show that multitasking kills learning. So we just, we really, I think we pride ourselves in our society of being able to multitask, but it's really not something that we can actually do. Plenty of sleep. Um, I would say schedule some time each day um, for something fun, having at least one supportive person that you can talk to every day, breathe deeply, and focus on how much you have done, not on how much you have not done. Um, I want to just do one more exercise with everybody with the breathing deeply. Um, so this is going, we're going to breathe in for a count of four, hold for a count of four, breathe out for a count of four, and hold for a count of two. So you can remember it, four, 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 two. So I just want um, maybe just to give you a minute, um, knowing that we're probably not all, all on the same page here, but just breathing in for a count of four, holding it for a count of four, Exhaling for a count of four. And then holding that for a count of two. And then repeating. When we are panicking or when we are anxious, our goal is to actually lengthen our exhale. So if our inhale, if you later on want to kind of test out where you're at, if your inhale is three seconds long, you really want your exhale to be six seconds long. And it's going to take practice and patience to get there. But one way that you can do this, um, and it feels probably kind of silly and it will look silly, but if you place your palm um, in front of your face at a, a little bit of a distance so that whenever you exhale through pursed lips, you're going to feel your exhale breath on the palm of your hand very, very gently, very lightly. So you're going to inhale and then you'll exhale through pursed lips. So it's like you're blowing out very slowly through a straw. This causes some resistance and it slows your exhale. It slows your breath down.
So that's called lengthening your exhale. If we do this for two minutes, then we can actually switch our fight, flight, stress, panic, um, nervous system into our, um, sorry, uh, rest and digest. So the relaxation, we can actually go from stressed, anxious to relaxed in two minutes of doing an exercise like that. One more exercise that you can do for two minutes is any, any exercise that you can get into any position that your head is below your heart. So one way that I like to do this is standing against the wall and then you bend over. So your head is in between your legs. Your head is closer to the ground than your heart is. And if you can stay in this position for two minutes, you can actually switch your system from fight, flight, stress to rest and digest, relaxed. All right. I had some other things I really wanted to get to, but um, I want to leave some time, a couple of minutes. I know I'm being paying attention to time. Time is important to everybody I know. Uh, we currently don't have any questions in the in the little cue box. So if you want to go through like this chart, I think that would be okay. Let's do it. Um, so this is one of my favorite things to review with clients. This is um, really the basis is that our thoughts are the foundation. Our thoughts are going to impact how we feel, um, how we respond how we act, and also how we see ourselves and how we see the world. It all starts with our thoughts. So these are 10 of the most common unhelpful thinking styles. And if you want to um, Google this afterwards, I, I hope that this is really helpful. I review this with all of my clients. Um, you can find this on Google, print it out, and keep it somewhere where you can see it. But just kind of skimming through quickly, the all or nothing thinking is sometimes called black and white thinking. So an example might be, if I'm not perfect, I have failed. Either I do it right or I do it not at all. It's either one way or the other. Overgeneralizing is um, seeing, like using a couple of examples or one example. So seeing a pattern based upon a single event or being overly abroad in the conclusions that we draw. An example might be, Nothing good ever happens. Like everything's always terrible. Um, very much overgeneralizing. Mental filter is only paying attention to certain types of evidence. Maybe noticing our failures, but not seeing our successes. Only looking at certain things. Disqualifying the positive is similar. It's discounting the good things that have happened or that you have done for some reason or another. Telling yourself like that doesn't count. Oh yeah, I did great on that test, but that doesn't count. Jumping to conclusions, there's either mind reading or fortune telling. So mind reading, we're either imagining, uh, we are imagining we know what others are thinking or fortune telling is predicting the future. So Melissa, I do have uh, one question. Um, is there any podcast slash books uh, that you would recommend on stress and mental health? Mm. I have a lot of different podcasts that I listen to. Um, Brene Brown is a favorite of mine. Um, she doesn't talk specifically about mental health and stress, but she um, does a great job talking about our experience of shame and um, connecting with ourself and, and our emotions. I would definitely recommend her. Um, oh, I'm forgetting her name now. Um, Tiffany Rowe is the founder of Mindful Counseling. She has a podcast and she has social media, so social media as well. Um, she is amazing for all things mental health. She's a therapist. 
And then um, the chart that I talked about with the anxiety symptoms came from an anxiety workbook. So there are workbooks out there that are very helpful. Um, there's mindfulness workbooks and exercises and the anxiety workbook as well. Is it okay to go through those workbooks like alone or do you, you suggest having to go through that with like a yeah. professional? Good question. Um, I, I think they're, they can be self-help books um, that you can do on your own or you can do with a therapist. I, I think either way. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, personal preference. If that's something that you, you want to just do on your own and be able to reflect on on your own, um, similar to like journaling and maybe doing some art exercises, I think that is totally fine. If you benefit more from talking it out and sharing with somebody, then I would definitely recommend doing that work with a therapist. Um, I'm also on social media. You can find me at Balance Breathe B. It's my business name. So I try to share just a, a plethora, like a wide variety of different posts relating to um, stress and anxiety and relationships and coping and the ways that we see ourselves, um, disordered eating. So feel free to follow me and I, I tag others that I follow on social media. And I guess just, just to, to follow up too with, um, if you are looking for a therapist um, and you are at a college counseling or college, college, if you're at a college or university, um, I think most of them have college counseling centers. So utilizing that as a first step, or you can look up therapists on psychology today and you can type in your zip code. You can type in the health insurance that you'll be using if you will be using that. Um, you can check mark if you're looking for like anxiety specific or relationship issues or disordered eating, trauma. Um, you can be specific about what you're looking for and then it will pull up the therapists that meet that criteria in your area. Uh, so we got a comment that says, uh, this presentation was wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank so, you. um, yeah, if you guys don't have, uh, any more questions or anything like that, um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, Melissa, thank you very much for, um, doing this forum with us and especially, uh, during this time that we really, really need it. And just taking a moment to, um, you know, just knowing that we we all need some sort of mental health check. Um, yeah. So this, this, this was really great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. Um, if anybody does have questions that you, you want to reach out to me individually, I can um, get my email up here. But again, you can find me. My, my company name is Balance Breathe B. So my email is just melissa at balancebreathebee.com. And I would be more than happy to walk you through connecting you with anybody if you want to um, be connected with a therapist or if you have questions about stress and stress management or anxiety or anything else, I'm more than happy. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, again, Melissa, thank you. Tressa, thank you. And uh, everyone, have a good evening. Thank you.